All right, so my clock says two o'clock, so let's go ahead and get going. Um, if you were here last time, then what you saw was this practice problem where we had to write a rate law. And remember, a rate law just started out with the word rate. Rate is equal to K times the concentration of the reactants raised to some power. That was very, very simple. Today, we're going to look at two different ways to accomplish the same thing. Notice that in this data table right here, there is no aspect of time other than its molarity per second. All of our rates of reaction are based on the original starting point. So we added the chemical, we took the rate of reaction at the very, very beginning when it's the fastest. We didn't give any clue of what might happen 20 minutes from now, what, what would happen 10 minutes from now. We know the reaction gets slower because there's fewer collisions as you use up reactants. But in general, we just looked at these things and said, oh, I can write a rate law. And that's really all we wanted to do. Last time I showed you some free response questions. Um, since that's all the AP exam will be is those free response questions, I'm gonna show you a couple more. What can you expect to see um, on uh, whatever the test days will be? Just a reminder, we don't know what the format's gonna be other than it's all uh, free response. We don't know how they're going to do it. We don't know what day they're gonna do it. All we know is that right now, there will be two separate test dates. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on a um, calculator. I mean, sorry, you can do it on your phone. You can do it on a laptop. You can do it on all different kinds of ways. So I saw somebody say they can't hear. Can somebody tell me if they can hear? Okay, thank you, Elida. Um, I have no idea if I got that right. Okay, thank you. All right, so if we're looking at the rate law then, um, we just wanna know, am I gonna be ready for the AP exam right now? That's really all that we're looking at. So can you write a rate law like these answers that we saw the other day? Most of y'all, you know, no one had big complaints about it or anything like that. So take the information, figure out what those exponents were. If you need more practice with that, go watch the webinar from last time. But let's talk about a different type of rate law, not the differential rate law where we were rate is equal to K times. This is called the integrated rate law. Now, for those of you in calculus, you'll think, oh, Integrals, integration, I've done this before. Those of you who aren't in calculus, you don't have a clue how this works, and that's totally okay. You don't have to understand the calculus behind it. You just really need to understand how can I use these equations to help me decide what's going on. So I came up with a simple um, thing that everyone can do. You can combine blue dye and bleach. And when you add blue dye and bleach, could be blue food coloring, it turns not blue anymore. So if I wanted to rate, write the rate law, it'd be rate is equal to K times the concentration of blue dye raised to some power times the concentration of bleach raised to some power. Easy peasy. But how do I know what's it gonna look like in 10 minutes, in 20 minutes, in 30 seconds? How can I measure the concentration? Well, we can use spectroscopy. So assuming you've covered spectroscopy, it's the idea that when you get something really concentrated, it gets really blue. In other words, something really blue absorbs a lot of light. Not a lot of light will pass through it. As it becomes less and less blue, then the absorbance of the light should get smaller and smaller. So let's see what happens when we pour bleach into blue dye. Notice the absorbance off on the right-hand side and notice the color of the solution as time goes by. All right, you'll notice that it went from blue to not blue and the absorbance went from a really high number down to a really low number. So using this idea, I can actually generate some data something I can use to uh, figure something out. Now, here's the question. If I needed to look for a certain absorbance, so I was given a colorimeter and it's got four wavelength settings, 
what wavelength would you pick? If you were gonna look for blue food coloring, would you look in the 700s? Would you look around 400? Would you look at 500? Or would you look somewhere else? And if you look at this graph, it looks like blue is most sensitive in here, right at the top, somewhere around 630 nanometers. So we would want to make sure we set our device to 630 nanometers. Well, what do you do if you're studying red food coloring, not blue food coloring? Well, it doesn't take a genius to see, you just pick a different wavelength. Now I know what I'm saying sounds silly, and you're like, surely this won't be on the AP exam. It has been before. They said, what do you do when you, if you have red food coloring? And it's like, um, you pick a different wavelength. So you, in order to understand the concentration of the blue dye, we need to know what wavelength of light to shine at it, and then we can measure how much it's absorbed. So here's a graph of what you just saw. Um, the blue food coloring and bleach over time. Now, here's what I did though. In order to make this work, I needed to make sure that the bleach has no effect. How do I make sure that the bleach has no effect? I don't have to worry about the order with respect to bleach. I just added a lot of bleach. Instead of being about the same concentration as the blue dye, I added a lot, a lot, a lot of bleach. That way, the bleach hardly changes at all. It's only the blue dye that's doing something. So if you notice, the absorbance, that's really the same thing as concentration. They're uh, directly proportional. So as time goes by, you notice that the graph starts off really steep, meaning the reaction goes fast. And then in the middle, it's not quite so steep, it slows down. And then near the end, it gets slower and slower. But notice this time we've got minutes in here. So we're comparing absorbance or concentration to time. And that's where the integrated rate law comes in versus that differential rate law we had before. There was no place to put in time over there. It was just concentrations. So I can look at this, but I'll tell you what, when I look at this graph, I can't tell whether it's first order or second order. It, it's really kind of hard to figure out what order it is. So don't worry about it, we got you covered. The integrated rate law and these three are shown right on your equation sheet. It's, um, if it's zeroth order, then when you plot concentration versus time and it gives you a straight line, then it's zero order. This is basically concentration versus time. It is not straight, so we know it's not zeroth order. If you plot the natural log of the concentration versus time, then when you plot that and it gives you a straight line, then aha, you know that it's first order. Same thing for second order, except instead of natural log of concentration, it's one over the concentration. So all we have to do is look at three graphs, find the one that's straight, match up the one that's straight with the correct equation, and boom, you automatically know what order it is. If it's zero order, it'll look something like this first graph. Straight line, concentration versus time, gotta be zeroth order. First order, that's your graph. And if it's one over concentration or concentration to the negative one power, and it gives you a straight line, then it's second order. You can't have all three graphs for one reaction. You can't have all three be straight. Two will be curvy, one will be straight. All you gotta do is go boom, picked up the answer. Now, this is the one I want you to notice right here. For a first order reactant, and you may need to write this down somewhere on the back of your hand or something so you remember it. For a first order reaction, the half-life is always constant. So this is the equation for half-life for a first order reaction. So sometimes they'll say, here's the half-life, find K. Boom, use the equation, drop it in. The half-life for zero order and second order is not constant. Those half-lives change with concentration change. 
So this one right here is on the equation sheet. These equations are also on the equation sheet. They just don't quite look at, like that. However, if you look at the equations, notice all of them are set up as y equals mx plus b. y equals mx plus b. They're all in slope-intercept formula. So if they all can be turned into slope-intercept formula, then how do you find, if this is your graph, how do you find the value of k? Take the slope, boom, done. If it's second order, how am I supposed to find a value for k? Uh, take the slope of that line, boom, done. So let's, let's do a practice problem and see what's going on. So we decomposed NO2 into NO and O2. Is it first or second order? I don't know because there's no rate over here. I can't do it like I did before. Wait, wait, wait. Just remember, all you got to do is look at the graphs. One of these graphs is straight. One of these graphs is curly. So here's one over the concentration is straight. Here's natural log of the concentration is not straight. Which one was one over the concentration? One over the concentration, boom, right there. I know it's second order. If the AP exam said, I need you to prove to me that it's second order, all you'd have to say is because one over the concentration gave me a straight line. Boom, you got a point. That's what they're asking you to do. Interpret the data. So how would you write the rate law? Well, rate is equal to K times NO2. And what power would we put on it? Well, we know it's second order. So it would be rate is equal to K times NO2 squared. Easy peasy. So let's see. That's exactly the right answer. So all you have to do is find the straight line graph, one over the concentration, natural log of the concentration, or just concentration. Match it up with the equation on your um, reference sheet, the one with all the equations on it, and boom, you're done. All right, so this is what they look like actually on the equation sheet. So just, just to make it a little bit harder for you, they put it in this weird form. Now, this concentration of A means concentration of A at some time T. A sub zero means what was the concentration initially? So zeroth order, the concentration at some time 10 seconds minus the initial concentration is equal to negative k, and t here would be 10 seconds. First order, also very similar. Second order, very similar. The trick is, can you rearrange these equations so that they go into slope-intercept formula? So can you take this equation right here and make it concentration of A is equal to negative kt plus the concentration of A at time zero? And this equation right here, it doesn't tell you it's first order, but you're smart enough to remember that that's the half-life equation for first order. That's all you need. All right, so we already did the one before where we figured out what order is it? What is the value of K? All right, so how could we find the value of K? Well, let's go back to that problem real quick. How do we find Okay, well, we could take the slope of this line, that's fine, or we could take any two points and we could take those two points and plug them into slope-intercept formula. We would have the time and the concentration and all we'd have to do is solve for K. So let's give that a stab. So what is the value of K? So this is the second order integrated rate law. So I need one over the concentration at time t. Well, what do we wanna pick? Well, let's just pick two values. I mean, let's pick a value in terms of seconds. So I picked the point 0380. So I picked 300 seconds. So I plugged in 300 seconds here, minus one over the initial concentration. Now, how do we know what the initial concentration is? That's at time zero. 
what was the concentration when you first started? So we picked 300 seconds. We picked the concentration at 300 seconds. We know the concentration at time zero. We plugged in and solve and boom, you got 0.543. right if the initial concentration in a closed vessel is 0.5 what is the concentration of this reactant after 0.5 hours well all we have to do is use that same equation one over the concentration at some time t so one over the concentration is equal to 0.543 that's our value of k that we got before times 1800 seconds. Now, where did the 1800 seconds come from? Well, the time in the table was in seconds. So that means K is in terms of seconds. So if you change a half an hour into minutes, half of an hour is 30 minutes, 30 minutes at 60 seconds for every one minute comes out to a total of 1800 seconds. That's where the 1800 came from. So the 0.543 came from what we had before, the 1800 came from the time, and this one over 0.5, remember that is one over the initial concentration. The problem told us that the initial concentration was 0.5. So if I plugged in 0.5, then, and I do all this math over here, I get one over the concentration of A is 979.4. And then if I take the reciprocal of that, I get 1.02 times 10 to the negative three. Pretty nifty. Find the equation that you need and then use it. So let's go back to our blue dye. Remember how I told you that we had to make the bleach really concentrated? That was so that the amount of bleach didn't have anything to do with how fast the blue dye went away. So the bleach, if I make it say one molar, even if it became 0.99999 molar, it's just not enough of a change. So I took that same data that I gave you before, you'll remember this graph, and I made all three graphs. I made a blue dye versus time, that's the one you saw before. I did a natural log of the blue dye versus time, and then one over the concentration of blue dye versus time. And remember, all we're gonna do is look at the three graphs, which one's straight. All right, so one over absorbance gives us this thing. Now, notice I've put in what the computer thinks is a line of best fit. That is not a linear graph. Down in the lower left, this is the concentration or absorbance, meaning, remember, they mean about the same thing. Absorbance is direct, directly proportional to concentration. So this is concentration versus time. And this is the thing that we saw before, definitely not straight. And then if you looked at the natural log of absorbance versus time, boom, that's the straight one. So if the blue dye versus time gave us a straight line, that would be zero order. If the natural log gave us a straight line first order, if one over the concentration, that would be second order. And remember, on the equation sheet, they're in order, zero, one, and two. So go back to our graph. All right, so what can I tell from that graph? Well, I can tell what the value of K is because K here is the slope of the line. So I had the computer, because I'm really lazy, I had the computer calculate the uh, time, I mean the slope intercept formula, excuse me, and the slope of this thing is negative 0.277, and my k value can't be negative, so I just find the slope of the line, and if it's negative, I make it positive, so this is 0.277, that would be my value for k. So three graphs, pick the one that's straight. So I would write a pseudo rate law like this. Remember, I left out the bleach because the bleach doesn't matter. Rate is equal to K times blue dye to the first power. And I know it's first powder because it's the first order integrated rate law. The value of K would be the slope of the line. Now, how could we figure out the order with respect to bleach? 
Well, I would just have to repeat the experiment, except this time, instead of adding a bunch of bleach, I would just repeat the experiments with two different concentrations of bleach, just like we did before when we were writing differential rate laws. So you would, you know the value um, with respect to the blue dye, you know it's first order. So we could actually, just like we did before, maybe have 0.1 molar and 0.2 molar bleach. And then I could look, how is the speed of the reaction affected? All right, so this is an actual question from years gone by. And what it wants to know is the reaction is first order explain how the data are consistent with a first order reaction. So I'm gonna let y'all think on that for about 20 seconds, kind of read over the question, see if you can come up with how is the data consistent with a first order reaction. I'm glad you guys have your mics muted because I expected a lot of heads pounding against the keyboard. There's no graph, Mr. Elegante. You said there'd be graphs to look at. I did say that, but can we do it without looking at a graph? Can we do it and still figure out that it's first order? Well, what I want you to do is look at those first three trials. Notice how the half-life is the same. The half-life for trial one, two, and three are all 100 seconds. And remember what I told you, that in a first order reaction, the half-life is constant. So all you have to say is, boom, half-life's constant, it's gotta be first order. How would you calculate the rate constant? Well, remember on the equation sheet, it gave you an equation for half-life. The half-life is equal to 0.693 over K. So what's the half-life? 100 seconds. Is the initial rate greater than, less than, or equal to the rate in trial two? Justify your answer. And then it talks about half-life. So let's give some thought. I can find K, I got part B, that's fine. This whole question is only worth four points. So that means each question's worth a point. So even if I don't get every single point, I can live with three out of four. So is the initial rate of one greater than, less than, or equal to in trial two? Well, the first words out of your pen, if you were answering this question, should be greater than, less than, or equal to. You have to pick one. You shouldn't say, well, after looking over the question, this is how I feel, answer the question. Is the initial rate greater than, less than, or equal to? So look at trial two versus trial one. What's the only difference? Temperature is the same volume's the same. Ooh, the pressure is twice as much. Well, how do you get more pressure if the volume and temperature are the same? There must be more molecules. So which one has more molecules? Trial two. So is the rate of the reaction in trial one greater than, less than, or equal to in trial two? Well, we learned the more particles you have, the more collisions. So that means Sorry, that means that trial two should go faster because it's got more particles having more collisions and trial one should go slower. We'll see if that's right or not. Then part D, the half-life of the reaction is less than the half-life in trial one. Explain why in terms of activation energy. Well, activation energy is the energy necessary to start a reaction. So, do you remember those weird curves that we drew before that looked like a giant bell curve? And that when the molecules got hotter, they got faster and that curve kind of spread out. So why? what's the difference between one and four? Well, the pressure is the same, the volume is the same, the temperature is higher in trial number four. So if the temperature is higher, how does that affect the activation energy? Hmm, well, that's a good question. So let's take a stab. Let's see if we got any of the points when we look at the rubric. 
it says for a first order reaction, half-life is independent of react reactant concentration. All you had to say is the half-life is constant in a first order reaction. Boom, point. Calculate the rate constant. Well, you know the half-life is 100 seconds, boom. You know it's 0.693 over 100 seconds, 0 0.00693. Now, how do you know what the units are? Well, the units are no unit on top, seconds on the bottom. So you could have written one over seconds, or you could have written seconds to the negative one power, or if you wanted to be weird, you really could have written hertz, because technically that's what an inverse second is. All right, you got one point for saying one, the rate of one is less than two, and you don't have to do all this fancy one. Basically, all you have to say is the concentration is smaller, and so it will go slower. You don't have to do all this fanciness. You basically are pointing out, hey, I know the concentration is smaller. That smaller concentration is less number of particles. Less number of particles is going to give you a, a slower rate of reaction. All right, the half-life is less. Why is that? Now, a lot of people said that if you change the temperature, you change the activation energy. This is not true at all. The activation energy is what the activation energy is, all right? So let me give you an example. You want to go to the movies. The movies cost you $7. Now, in general, everybody only has, on average, $3. A couple people have $10. A couple people have $1. But in general, there are a couple people that have enough money to get in the movie to overcome that activation energy, but not everybody does. But the average is three. So now let's give everybody a raise. Now, instead of the average amount of money being three, now it's five. Now, there will still be some people with just $1 and there'll be some people with $13 because in general, the spread of how much money people has goes up. But if everybody gets a raise, then there's more people with enough money to get into the movies. That's all that this is saying. The average kinetic energy is greater with the higher temperature. Therefore, more molecules have enough energy to overcome the activation energy, or more molecules are past the activation energy barrier. Again, you don't have to be all fancy like this to earn that point. You have to just get that idea across to the reader that you understand that more molecules have enough energy to overcome activation energy. All right, here's another question. And this is actually from an AP exam, I think in 2017. What are they mixing together? <gasps> Blue food, food coloring and bleach. What is that? All right. They set the spectrophotometer to 635 nanometers. The wavelength that's best. They collected a bunch of data. When they collected a bunch of data, they produced three graphs. All right, y'all. All you have to do is figure out which one is zeroth order, which one is first order, and which one is second order. Well, if you looked at those equations one more time, either on the sheet or in your notes, absorbance or concentration versus time is zeroth order. Natural log of concentration versus time is first order. One over concentration is second order. They put them in order, zero, one, and two for you. Not that they'll always do it, but based on the graphs above, what is the order of the reaction with respect to the blue food coloring? Well, this one's straight, which means that one, it lines up with the first order integrated rate law, boom, first order. Y'all look at this question. Does it say justify or explain your answer? No. So what should you say? first order. Done. You answered the question. All right, so let's see what else they asked for. Part B, the reaction is known to be first order with respect to bleach. So we know it's first order with respect to blue dye. They're letting you know it's first order with respect to bleach. And now the student sets up some more experiments. But the problem is 
the reaction mixture, <coughs> excuse me, mixture reaches an absorbance near zero too rapidly. That's a fancy way of saying the blue goes away too fast. Now they could have said the blue goes away too fast, but they're testing your knowledge to see if you understand absorbance goes to zero. That just means all the light goes through it. In order to correct the problem, the student proposes the following three modifications. Circle the one that would correct the problem and explain how the modification increases the time uh, for the reaction mixture to reach an absorbance near zero. This is what you've been doing in your classes called claim evidence reasoning. The claim is the one you're circling and you're basically then trying to explain the idea of why that works. So increasing the temperature, would that work? Would that make the reaction go slower so that it didn't um, turn into just looking like water? No, increasing the temperature makes faster collisions. Increasing the concentration of the blue food coloring, mm, that sounds reasonable. Increasing the concentration of the bleach, that just sounds like it bleached it out even faster. So there's really only one answer that makes sense. And so you would circle the middle one and then try to explain why you picked that one. In another experiment, a student wishes to study the oxidation of red food coloring. How would the student modify the original procedure to determine the order? Well, we talked about this before. How would you do it? Pick a different wavelength. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a question that is so easy and you can get all these points. So let's look at, um, sorry, uh, I thought I had the thing up there. So uh, you get one point for saying first order and you get uh, one point basically for coming in here and circling one. You get one point therefore for saying, hey, if I add more blue food coloring, it'll take longer for it to go away. And then lastly, I would pick a new wavelength. If you do that, you got all four points. In a year where the average was about 1.7, you can do this, totally doable. All right, so, We've covered differential rate laws. We've covered integrated rate laws. Can we figure out order or can we do kinetics one more possible way? Well, sometimes a chemical reaction is way too involved for everything to happen all at once. You don't just take a pile of ingredients, slap them together in the air and they fall out as cookies out of the oven. You know to make cookies, it's a series of steps that you have to go through. So we can take any chemical reaction and break it down into steps or uh, stepwise mechanisms. So we call those stepwise mechanisms elementary steps. So an elementary step is something that happens one step at a time that adds up to the total reaction. All right, now, the slowest step. Do y'all know what the slowest step is in your family when y'all go out to eat? you're going to church, you're going somewhere, there's always one person in your car who we call the rate determining person. Doesn't matter how soon you get there, if your sister or brother is still upstairs doing their hair, then you know that it, you're not gonna be able to leave till they get downstairs and get in the car. Maybe it's your mom or dad. If you don't think that your family has that person, you're that person. You're the rate determining step. You're the person that decides when everybody leaves. Every chemical um, equation has a rate determining step. So we can teach you some fancy words. If two molecules hit each other in a elementary step, we call that bimolecular. If it's only one, it's unimolecular. And if it's three things, two A's and a B, all running into each other all at the same time, with the energy and the orientation, we call that termolecular, right? <clears throat> so can you tell, here's where we start, here's where we end up. Can you tell me how many steps there are in this graph? Well, there's two, because there's two humps. Looks like a camel, hump and a hump. 
So this is the activation energy from the top of this hill down to where you started. That's the activation energy of the first step. And then for the second step, this is where you started and this is where you ended up at the top of the hill. So from here to here, that would be the activation energy for the second step. Because the activation energy is so big for the first step, it's going to be called the rate determining or slow step. So all you gotta do is read a graph. All right, a couple words you guys need to know. An intermediate is something that's not there in the beginning and it's not there at the end. Notice, H2O2 becomes water in O2. What is this IO thing? Well, it's not there in the beginning, it's not there at the end, it's something that's made in the middle of things. So an intermediate is something that shows up in the middle, shows up from one step, and then gets used up in a different step. A catalyst is something that lowers activation energy, speeds up a chemical reaction, and so a catalyst is something that shows up in the beginning and shows up at the end, almost as like, almost as if nothing ever happened. So this I minus here, this iodide ion, is acting as a catalyst where it turns the H2O2 into H2O, and then at the end it regenerates I minus. So that's a catalyst, something that is there in the beginning and is there at the end but doesn't show up in the overall equation because I minus isn't changing, right? It's there in the beginning, it's there at the end. All right, so here's an equation. Here's a rate law. So why isn't the CO there? Well, CO would be zeroth order and anything to the zeroth order is one. So let's look at the mechanism for this reaction and see if we can figure out why does the CO not in the rate law? Well, here's two NO2s turning into NO3 and NO, and then CO comes in the second step. So we make a intermediate called NO3 here, but the CO isn't needed until the second step. And if we look at the speed of the steps, the first step is the slowest step. So the reaction is not going to depend on the CO. The CO comes in in the second step, not in the first step. And since the first step is the slowest step, we call that the rate determining step. Right, so adding CO really isn't gonna make a big difference because it's really all about the NO2. All right, so here's what you're gonna to have to do. Can you find a set of mechanisms that work? So sometimes they'll give you a rate law and they'll say, hey, which one of these set of steps agree with this? So you, they have to add up to the overall reaction and the rate law has to match the slowest step. So here's one to look at. The experimentally determined rate law is K times NO2 times F2. Now they got that from data, the experimental data. You know the order is first order for both reactants. And then they say, hey, here's a set of steps. Does it work? So remember, they have to add up to the overall equation and it has to agree with the rate law. So y'all go ahead and take 20 seconds and see, hmm, does it meet those criteria that it adds up to the overall equation and that it agrees with the rate law? Right, so let's see if they add up. So if you take these two equations, just like we do with Hess's law and some of those things, we're gonna cancel out things that are the same on the left and the right, almost like spectators. I have an NO2 on the left, another NO2 on the left. 
So in my overall equation, I should have two NO2s. All right, good. I have an F all by itself and an F all by itself. Those kind of cancel out left and right. So I those cancel out. So I have one F2 and that's it. So I should have one F2 in the overall equation. And I make two NO2Fs. So in my overall equation, I should have NO2F. So yes, that passes the first test. Now, does it agree with the rate law? Well, I know if you're like most of my students, they're like, how do we know what the slow step is? They literally say slow and fast, or they say rate determining step, or they say slow or slower. They will tell you which one the slow step is. Or they'll tell you, hey, here's the rate law, pick which one of these steps is the slowest. And you just have to match the rate law with the slowest step. There's one NO2 here, which makes, makes it NO2 with an exponent of one. There's one F2 here, so it becomes F2 to the first power. So yes, it does uh, meet the two requirements. Right, so here's another FRQ that I pulled for you. It just looks weird because of formatting. NO2 turns into NO and O2. You'll see a lot of NO. No means no, I guess, all the time. Now, didn't I promise you there would be some graphs? Let's see. Here's concentration of, here's one over concentration, and here's one natural log of concentration. So, Explain how the graphs indicate that the reaction is second order. They're not even asking you to say what order is it. They're saying, how do you know it's second order? Well, here was the order that they gave them to you in the test. They, this was the first graph. This was the second graph. This was the third graph. So you can't count on the fact that they're always gonna go zero, one, two for you. You're gonna have to look back at the equation sheet and match up the y-axis with the equation. Here's one over the concentration gives me a straight line. Therefore, that is the second order integrated rate law and its second order. One over the concentration gave me, um, when it's straight, gives me second order. Write the rate law. Well, we know it's second order, so rate should be equal to K times NO2, the reactant, squared. That seems reasonable, right? Those two things, pick which one's the straight line, write the rate law because we know it's second order. Here's the next part, and this is why I pulled this question for you. Here's two possible mechanisms. Is it consistent with the rate law you just wrote? Well, so you'd have to go back to the rate law you wrote we know it's second order, that's why I put an exponent of two there. We only had one reactant, that's why it's just NO2. So does mechanism one agree? So give that some thought. Take 20 seconds. Remember, it's got to add up to the overall equation. And it also has to agree with the rate law, the slowest step. So go ahead and take 20 seconds and see if it agrees. Did it add up to the overall reaction? Uh, rate is equal to K times NO, I mean, sorry. Does the slow step agree with that rate law? Well, the slow step is this one. They told you it was the slow step. There's two NO2s. In an elementary step, the number of molecules becomes the exponent. So yes, it does. Does it add up to the overall reaction? Well, the overall reaction looks like Two NO2s turn into NO and O2. So two NO2s, the NO3 is an intermediate. It cancels out, creates two NOs plus O2. 
So is it consistent, your answer? Yes, justify your answer. It agrees with the rate law, boom, and it adds up to the overall equation. What about mechanism two? Well, mechanism two is something that most AP teachers hate. I'm gonna do my best to explain it, but it can be a little hard. So this may be something you wanna go over with your teacher as you get closer to the exam. When you see a double arrow like that, it means equilibrium. And it even says over here, fast equilibrium. What that means is that if you add NO2, it will very quickly turn into N2O4. So basically, I like to tell my students that double arrow is the same thing as an equal sign. So NO2 and NO2 is the same thing as N2O4. So when you get a fast equilibrium step that comes before the slow step, I want you to just treat the equation above as a mathematical entity where these two things equal this thing and substitute. So again, when you get a fast equilibrium before the slow step, substitute. So here's N204, here's N204. So I would just take the NO2 plus NO2 and substitute it down in this equation. So does it agree with the rate law? If this is the slow step down here, NO2 plus NO2, Yes, it agrees with that rate law up there. Does it add up to the overall equation that was given to you in the problem? It's still NO2s, two NO2s. The N2O4s cancel out and you make two NOs and O2s. Those, both of them are valid mechanisms. They could work. So if you look at this, does it agree? Yes, step one is slow. Boom, it agrees with the rate law. I get the answer. I get the point. This hot mess down here, you can look at if you want to, and you can try to make yourself feel better about it. But basically, this is why AP teachers hate this. This is a very, very complicated way of saying KEQ gets tossed into this mix here, and that just makes it kind of hard. That's why I said when two things are in fast equilibrium, just substitute. Fast equilibrium basically means that they're one and the same, so it's really like saying NO2 and NO2 makes two NOs and O2. And you know what? If you don't get this point because you don't sound sciencey enough, you can still pass the AP exam. Right, in Catalyst, and we're almost to the end, thank y'all for staying with me. Catalyst basically lower the activation energy without being used up. Enzymes are catalysts. So the red thing up here, this is an exothermic reaction that loses energy as you go. This is the activation energy from where you are to the top of the hill. And with a catalyst, you still start and stop at the same point it's just that you lower the activation energy. Think of it as like driving over a mountain. Wouldn't it be easier if instead of driving all the way up over the mountain, if you could bore a tunnel right through the middle of it, then that would make it easier to get through. Lots of different catalysts in the world, okay? Uh, they're really not gonna ask you for these, but in order for you to make everything that you have in your everyday life, all the plastics, all the uh, lovely face creams and things we put on our body, most of those do better with catalysts. And the only way we can have them for cheap prices is because of catalysts. And the only reason why you're alive is because of enzymes. They lower the activation energy necessary. Right? So let's see if you can spot the catalyst in this reaction. This is from an actual AP question from years ago. Here's chlorine in the very beginning, the red thing. Here's chlorine at the very end. It's there in the beginning, it's there in the end, almost as like it went through the reaction untouched. 
But that is the definition of a catalyst, something that is not used up in the reaction, it's regenerated, and it lowers the activation energy. So CLO, that would be an intermediate, and the CL would be a catalyst. So can y'all tell me which one is the rate determining step? The one with the highest peak, right? So from where you are to the top of the hill, the activation energy, the greater the activation energy, then the harder it is to achieve that one step, right? So to finish up our time together, according to the diagram, is this endothermic or exothermic? So I'm gonna let you think about that for a minute. And I want you to think about, and go ahead and draw it out on your paper if you can, draw what you think the curve would be. So I'm gonna give you a solid minute to come up with what you think the answer for I and II is. So I'll give you a solid minute starting now. All right, that's a minute. So is it exothermic or endothermic? Justify your answer. The first words out of your pen should be one word or the other, and then draw the curve. Let's see how you would have done. And this question came from in the last three years. It's just not one of the released ones. It's kind of a secret one, but y'all can do this. Ready? It's exothermic because you lose energy. That's easy enough. You start here and you end up with less energy, so it's exothermic. And then notice what you have to do. All you have to do is the line has to start at the same point and end at the same point, and it has to have less of a hill. You could have drawn it like this, where you went up a little bit higher. You could have done it a little bit lower as long as you start and stop at the same point, and as long as you go up, not quite as high as the hill that was there, boom, you get that point. Now, I know I make it sound kind of simple. I gotta tell you, you know a lot when you know how to do this. If you were just given this question on day one, y'all would probably put a smiley face right there in the middle and be done with it. You can do this. All right, so that's all I got for today. Uh, Brandon, can you uh, unmute your mic and tell me what you're talking about with the half-life? And if anybody has any other questions, you can either type them in the chat or you can um, just unmute and ask me. All right, well, Brandon, if you have a question, um, oh, okay, thank you, Michael, uh, Mr. Poe. Um, so obviously if y'all have questions, then uh, feel free to ask your teachers. And if teachers, if you have questions, feel free to ask someone, not me. Actually, you can ask me, I probably just won't know the answer. So um, the key here is y'all can totally do this. And um, I know that you're gonna do well on the exam. Don't forget, we got one more of these coming up um on wednesday at two o'clock when we're going to be talking about equilibrium in general you're welcome you're welcome ashley sorry and uh i'm wearing a bacon suit this time who knows what i'll be wearing next time so you should come 
Um, and obviously teachers, if you find that there's a great need or students, if you find like, I really don't understand whatever, please let Matt Dean know. And so we can try to find resources that make everybody successful. You're welcome. And teachers, if you're on and you got questions, you can go ahead and let them fly too. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I like the hat too. Um, let's see. Uh, the two rules for elementary steps. So Jackson, they are in your notes um, that available um, on, uh, from your teacher or that uh, Matt Dean sent out. But um, basically the elementary steps have to add up to the overall chemical equation. And they also, the slowest step of those elementary steps has to agree with the rate law. Uh, the next live is Wednesday at two o'clock and it's going to be over KSP and equilibrium.